What is going on guys? Welcome to the Wednesday live stream. Hopefully everyone's having a, a fabulous day today. We got John Lee, what's going on? Port Wolf, how you guys doing today? Hopefully everyone's having a fabulous week. So Lee, upgrading your tank. Nine by three by twenty eight. That is some stellar dimensions. It'd be just having a tank that big would be awesome. That's super long. Uh, Dustin, Exo Reef, Days Plantification. What's going on, boys? Good to see you guys. What's going on, Reefers? <laughs> Maple Smokehouse. <laughs> nice. They look tasty. Yeah, so Port Wolf's always trying to send me food photos when I'm streaming, trying to make me hungry. Mike, what's going on, buddy? Good to see you, man. Um... Yeah, just another live stream day, kind of a random Q&A session today and whatever other rabbit holes you guys want to go down. Phil, what's happening, Reefkeeper? Good to see you, buddy. So since we're talking tank upgrades, I, I'm not sure if, if we're calling this an upgrade or a downgrade or a swap, but I've been debating changing out this tank. And I've been like very contemplating this one quite a bit lately. And the main reason is if you take a look at my office, it is not that big of a room. And it, if the door is shut, it gets very warm and very humid in here. Now this is a lot of water volume. I measured it the other day. And this thing is 79 by 28. And then, so which I worked out to, it's, it's about 15, dish high 15 and a half square feet. And on top of that, we also have my sump. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but the sump is four foot by two foot. So that's like the size of a normal tank is for just for the sump. So that's, you know, so that's another eight square feet. So if we're looking at all this stuff, I'm like, that's almost 24 square feet of like surface area in a very tiny room. So this is what's making me swap and change the tank. But I also love the big tank, so it's like this big battle back and forth myself mentally. So I'm down all these rabbit holes just looking at different options of what I would change it to. Um, do you think a two foot less tank could make a huge difference? I think so. I think part of it is the fact that I have an open stand. So I essentially have like the equivalent of a four foot 90 gallon tank as my sump plus my, you know, almost seven foot tank. So I do think it would make a decent difference, like having a stand contained, having the sump separated and having a smaller surface area. So possibly. So I am debating swapping it. And I'm still trying to decide if I did a four foot or a five foot tank. Yeah, for the humidity, for sure. So I'm, I'm leaning towards a five foot tank because I don't want to go too small, but I also want something because I don't know. I, I'm still debating and I still like the shallow look. So we'll, we'll see. My, my current runner up, just while we're on the subject. Doo -doo 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 -doo. So currently this is what I'm leaning towards is probably a five foot tank. So I'm not going super small but it would still be the shallow look. So this one's 16 high. So if we look at my big tank now, let's do the, yeah, so if we look at this one now, um, this one is 14 inches tall and 28 front to back and 78 inches long. So that, yeah, so it'd be a smidge more, but it'd still be shallow. And I do have a dehumidifier and I do run it, but I don't know. We'll see. If the window's open, not a big deal, but if my door is shut, window shut, anything, it just gets crazy humid in here. So we'll see. So I don't know. I'm happy with my other water box, so I don't know 100%, but that's my current contender that I may end up with. We'll see. Um, so yeah, po possible option right here, and I've been like contemplating all the different options, and that's cool dimensions, and it would still give me a shallow look, which I like, so potential. Potential on that one. Um, why not just get some plastic covers? If you, the one big thing is, cause I do do like, I do work from home as well. I do IT stuff, I do meetings. And when you put covers on the tank, it also does reflect a lot of the light. And then you got all the blue cast. And it doesn't mess with the video bit, which isn't the best. Um, the other consideration is too, cause I have a kid now, you know, having proper stand doors on the sump and the stand and having that separate off is probably a good idea. Um, I haven't had an issue yet, you know, there's been no random stuff appearing in my sump so far, which is awesome. But, you know, having a proper stand is probably a better idea. So there's a few different considerations that are leaning towards me thinking about doing this. And, uh, alright, any thoughts on solar slash battery as a primary power for a tank with a 20 amp ATS and city power as a backup? 
Um, absolutely, you could. I know actually in the chat, uh, Reefkeeper, his whole house is running off solar. So technically his whole tank is solar as well. I've only used it for the battery backup. So I use that just to cover my power heads in the event of a power outage. And that recharges off solar. So I mean, if we're out of power for days and days and days, at least my tank would still outflow. So you absolutely could. If you wanted to run your whole tank with your lights, you know, heaters, everything else, and that's a lot more juice. Um, you know, just looking at, I know if I take a look at the extra 30s on my water box, you know, it's 450 watts, 480 watts. Like it's a good chunk of thing. And if you, you know, add in power heads and all the different gear that adds up. So usually for battery backup scenarios, I only look at adding the flow on it because your corals, your fish, they're fine without lights for a few days, but they will not be fine without flow. But I mean, if you can do the whole tank, whole house, I mean, that's a pretty sweet win. Uh, Port Wolf, you need to move out of the closet and build a streaming studio gallery. You know, I would love a 14 by 20 foot building. I've thought about it. Um, I've debated kind of like kicking out my deck and then closing in the old deck and turning that into a big studio space or, you know, close the old carport into a garage. But again, that would be a good chunk of change to do that. So maybe one day I'd love to do that at some point, but sadly, it's not a cheap thing to do, but maybe one day. Um, do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah, it looks probably. Yeah, same thing with plastic covers. You know, they'll block some of the light, they reflect the light around the room when you have stuff on there. I have kind of played with it, you know, it does help, but yeah, one of those things. So we'll see. So it's like that trade off of like not going too small and still having a big cool tank. And if I do do this, I have been debating what I would do for kind of a theme for it. And I was thinking about it. I love shaggy corals. Like Millie's are one of my favorite echoes. You know, I love Gonies. I love the big polypy thing. So I think the theme would just be like super shaggy polypy. So it'd be very acro Millie heavy, you know, and probably Gonie heavy and just have a super shaggy polypy tank. That's that's kind of how I decide if I go down that road, what's going to happen. Um, you do. On, on the other side note, any reef questions you guys shoot have at her you know anything you guys want to know or dig into shelly good to see you welcome to the wednesday saltwater reef chat yep so feel free to ask away whatever burning questions you guys have today this is kind of a free-for-all uh what else is new i do an update on the nano gani tank so far it's looking fairly polypy right now, which is good. Almost got rid of all my hair algae little bits in there, but it's definitely died back quite a bit since doing the peroxide treatments. Uh, city power is expensive. High percentage of my power is my tank. You know, that's about half mine too. <laughs> I'm thinking solar slash battery, keep the whole tank off grid and reduce the monthly power bill. Absolutely can. You can do, which there is um, inverters where you can set it up so you can tell it which priority. So you can say, okay, solar's number one priority, then battery, then grid. And that way, you know, if your batteries have run out, it knows priority of which one to suck power from, which one to do. So you absolutely can do that. But again, that's gonna cost you, you know, a good chunk of change to do it. So you gotta consider how much your power costs and how much it costs you to do this. Definitely, thank you for the super chat. Be sure to hit that like button. Definitely guys, look in that YouTube algorithm if you guys just smash the like button, always appreciated. Uh, Empire Reefer, do you recommend amino acids during the day or night? Uh, historically, I probably would have said more towards the night, but at the end of the day, I don't think it really matters. Also with aminos too, you got to look at what you're dosing to the tank. Now I used to dose aminos and they absolutely made a difference, but I also feel that a lot of the frozen food I feed also adds aminos, so I don't really need to dose it too much anymore. Um, so if you're feeding frozen, you might not even have to worry about it. If you're mainly feeding, you know, drier pellets, then dosing aminos is likely beneficial. I honestly don't think it's a massive difference between when you, you know, dose it. I think any time's good. But historically, I would have dosed it kind of at nighttime or around when I'm feeding the tank anyways. Uh, Mike, any experience and thoughts on dipping corals with potassium chloride? Love it. Um, potassium chloride, I find, is one of the more gentler dips on the corals, but it seems to be very effective on a lot of the pests. So the potassium salts, potassium chloride, I think is like an excellent dip. And yeah, I found, you know, in the past with, you know, like the Coral X Revive, you know, if I got a fresh coral in and I dipped it, you know, sometimes you'd even lose a coral from that extra stress of shipping plus the stress of dipping. 
So ideally, if you have a holding tank, let it sit for a day or two to recover first and then dip it. It's a really good way to go. With that being said, I found the potassium chloride based dips to be way gentler on the coral and stress it out less. Um, so yeah, definitely support it. Uh, squid missile. I just got a staghorn, a staghorn crab at a reef show. Never heard of such thing. Super cool. I'm picturing one in my head, but I can see if I can pull up a picture of it. Because those things are crazy looking. Yeah, so it's not something I've ever kept. But they're pretty crazy. Like, if you look at, like, the big... Uh, if it opens. But yeah, super crazy looking crabs. So yeah, let me know that goes long term. I'm kind of curious because I've never had one. Um, Any experience with cleaner shrimp surviving in-tank interceptor? I would not advise that one. Anything that is going to attack inverts will absolutely affect your shrimp. Um, I've have heard of coral wholesalers treating a tank with bear one time, actually. And that took out all of the shrimp um, just from a little bit in there. So if you're going to do that, like if you're using something like bear, I've never personally used interceptor, but I would be cautious using in tank. But if you're doing it as a coral dip, I would kind of have like two separate dips of your corals and make sure you get all of that chemical off before you put it back in your tank. Uh, Ryan, can you make a guess of what percentage of your trace A and K replenish? Next time I do an ICP test, I will answer that for you. I'm blindly dosing about eight mil a day of each. I don't know if that's too high. I don't know if it's too low. It's been on my to-do list to send an ICP test, but I haven't got around to it yet. But maybe I'll maybe I'll get one sent off this week, and then I'll let you know how it's keeping it. Um, any tips for keeping growing gonies? I have three of them every one day, and one of them is sulking. Um, gonies do like to be fed. They do like um manganese so make sure you're dosing trace elements has manganese in it i have alpha reef on the doser which i am doing on the nano which seems to be doing the job before i was using that i did manually dose some manganese periodically um they do like to be fed i find so if you do feed any particulate foods to the tank periodically they will be happier as well uh are they any nice looking for a gravity fed ato i mean simple and it works Portwolf, how knowledgeable are you on breeding and maintaining flamboyant cuttlefish or jellyfish? I have never had a cuttlefish flamboyant. Cuttlefish are super cool because they're like mandarins but psychedelically and they can change. Really cool. Um, I did a video of, I believe it was the Toronto Aquarium or the Ripley's Aquarium in Toronto. And I believe it was them who was breeding jellyfish. And I did some video where they had like all these grow trays and all the polyps at different stages. So give that one a watch. Um, I've have had a jellyfish. I've kept them, but I've never tried to breed them. But it's pretty cool. Matt Reef, what are you drinking? PNS Bio? No, this is rum and pineapple juice. It's tasty. Um, do to do, do brief keeper. Use it, Mike. I've only been using that as a dip. Works great. Yeah, potassium salts. It's awesome. Um, I've got a small coral order coming in tomorrow. I've never done it. What's a good mixing ratio? Keep not worry about a strong solution. The Polyp Lab 1, I believe it is, that's the one that I've been using. Um, assuming it's potassium salts, you could probably still get their label, do something similar. Uh, Phil, use two tablespoons per gallon, let it sit for 15 minutes. Uh, Exo Reef, what, does Cipro, what dose of Cipro would you recommend for brown jelly outbreak? I have done it as a dip with... I think it's a 500 milligram pill and a thing for torches. I have not done an in-tank treatment, but look up the KFC dip and follow his, instru his instructions. Um, that's kind of what I based mine off of, and it definitely worked well to help torches. Uh, Squid Missile picked up a glitter, gone out of show for 40 bucks. Solid deal on a nice little frag. Uh, can I break it down to a smaller batch, like one tablespoon for half a gallon? Yeah, I think you're safe on that one, Mike. It should scale. Yeah, uh, Josh, careful, Cipro in tank, you mess up, bacteria, composition. Yeah, so I agree. I am hesitant to use it in tank because it very well is not going to discriminate and it's going to kill all kinds of different bacteria. 
So it probably is why wise to dose some types of beneficial bacteria after you do a treatment, just to help make sure that you're boosting up the good guys after you kill off a chunk of them. Um, but personally, if you can remove the coral, it is safer to dip it in a separate container. Uh, do, 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 do. Squid missile, follow the KFC dip, works great. Yeah, that's basically what I used when I used the Cipro in the past. Uh, Richard, Bayer is the easiest going dip for white bugs slash black bugs. Uh, KCI lets them go through. Yeah, so if it is for white or black bugs, Bayer for sure. But if you have inverts in your tank, rinse them well. Like I would have two different salt water dips and dip in one, give it a swish, put in the next one and give it another swish just to make sure you're not getting any bear in the tank. Because it absolutely could take out, you know, cleaner shrimp or and all those little guys in your tank. So that, that's the biggest thing. I haven't personally had an issue, but I've had horror stories from like wholesalers in other places where they dip corals and it's like taking out cleaner shrimp, you know, or peppermint shrimp in their tanks. Um, Ixel Reef, what beneficial bacteria can you dose? What's the name of the product? I don't know. There's tons of them out there. Pick some of your brands and personally, I would just dump a couple random ones in and make a bit of a bacteria soup of goodness just to help boost things up. Um, uh, I followed revive instructions and it nuked my pulsing exenia. Well then, there you go. Um, never dipped xenia actually. Xenia is that weird one that I always like it, but I'm always scared to put it in my tank of fear of it taking over. One day, one day we'll do a, a Xenia only nano just for fun. Uh, do, do, do. But yeah, most of these stuff for talking about breaking in smaller batches, like absolutely just cut the water volume in half, cut the whatever your medication or dip or calcium chloride, whatever you're putting in there in half. And it, it does kind of scale. At least from my experience, I've always done that. Never had an issue. Um, Phil, have you ever dipped a trachea in it? I have not had any issues dipping anything in potassium salts. Um, that being said, I would always be hesitant with something like a smooth skin acropora because I find they're sensitive to everything. So if you have, you know, your deep water smooth skins, like be hesitant with those or mix your dip a lot lighter with those. That being said, they're usually pretty easy to just visually inspect to make sure there's nothing on it. Uh, Reef Keeper, Coral MD is also a really good dip. I think it's mostly herbal, but I'm not 100% sure it smells good. Um, I haven't used Coral MD. I have to look that one up. D -d -d -d. Coral MD. Okay. Oh, I have used that actually. That's the right one. There you go. Um, do -do -do. KFC for Zoa should be okay then. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about Zoa. Zoas can survive anything. If they're overly priced, they'll melt and under nor normal circumstances or n anything else, the normal though is they're pretty rock solid. I wouldn't worry about them, so you should be safe. Uh, squid missiles. Anyone use eight, tried H2O2 for any of those red black bugs or other pests? I've never heard of people using it. I've heard of people using it for algae. Every time he uses a dip, seems to wipe out the inverts. It will definitely kill pods and other little creatures. I've used it on zoophrags very well to get rid of anything but the zoa on there and that's worked very well um i haven't really tried it on acros and other ones for that <laughs> reef keeper every dip i've used on red dragon smooth skin yep everything kills it so that's a super finicky frag and same thing i've had it yeah i think i tried like four times till i finally had like a successful frag of that one and now it's like massive my tank but again very susceptible to dipping uh, do you get any PNS products in Canada? JNL used to sell, but don't sell anymore. Um, I've never tried any of the PNS products personally. I've debated order from BRS. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll keep an eye out for it, but yeah, no, it's not something I've tried. I'm curious if any of you guys have used it, what you think of it. Uh, yeah, Zoas are rock stars in a peroxide dip. Like, don't, you know, don't leave in there for like five minutes, but you can do like a you know, 60 second dip and you're pretty safe. Uh, Port Wolf, attending any shows this year or know of any new equipment coming out? Um, there should be some cool new equipment on the horizon. Nothing that's official yet, but as for shows, I am not 100% sure yet. I'm still, I don't know. I have a feeling I might end up at Magna in the fall. 
any of the sooner shows. I don't know if I can swing it or not, but we'll see. I normally like to hit up Rap Orlando, but that's obviously not happening at this moment. But yeah, we'll see. Maybe later, later summer, fall, see what I can sneak for some shows. Um, any thoughts on Red Sea pumps? I have the skimmer and controller. I have not used any of the Red Sea pumps. So I got nothing on that one. Uh, Reefkeeper. Been seeing that. One case I saw came from a very reputable coral seller. Yeah, I know. It's such a, I don't know, pests are such a thing in this hobby. You think a lot of the coral breeders would, you know, dip their stuff and get it out of their systems and not pass it along. But I think that's always the risk if you're getting, you know, maricultured or fresh stuff from ocean. It's more likely to have some of these pests on it than if you get from someone that just grows out frags within their own system. Oh, Keith. Have you seen a fix for chrysophytes? I've fighting them for a while and it's in a very old system. 10 year old rock. Okay, so I've had them in the past. They were a pain in the butt to get rid of. I think I did a video on them. I kind of did the kitchen sink approach at them. I'd have to go back to the video to know for sure what I did, but I believe I was dosing silicates. Um, like Excel, the sponge Excel, whatever it is, to feed the diatoms essentially. So kind of causing a diatom bloom to help out or compete them. And I was also doing, I believe I was using Brightwell's, there's like a razor and another product. Phil probably knows the answer. But they're kind of ones to fight some of the nasties as well as using hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, it basically threw the kitchen sink at it. And I did beat them, but it did take a, it was like a good month or two battle to finally get rid of them. Um, yeah, microfactor clean. See, need no fill. Thank you. So I literally just did the kitchen sink approach at them. Because same thing, I was fighting them for a couple months. Yeah, sponge power, sponge excel. Um, I have not tried the concoction yet. It's still on my to-do list. I do want to just start randomly finding the thing. That that being said, I still don't know like the full ingredients list because it's very like loosey you know, these types of things. So I might just try making my own with all the random coral foods and bacteria I have and basically just make a soup and bubble it and then try dosing it and see what happens. Um, probably not in this tank because it's not as coral heavy, but the water box definitely, I mean, there's no shortage of coral in there, so probably suck it up. So on my to-do list, hasn't happened yet though. Yeah, they do have it in stock. I had the, since that live stream, I put the in stock notification. I saw that last night, so it made me think about it. Um, all these bugs and diseases are, must exist in the ocean, but there has there been any investigation how they are eradicated there, or do we have a problem in our glass boxes? Okay. In the ocean, stuff is so spread out, it's not going to overwhelm a single coral. And yeah, exactly, Lewis. Like, you're going to have natural predators, you're going to have wrasses, you're going to have fish picking up them. And in the ocean, you know, coral is more spread out. It's not, you know, two inches away from each other like they are in our tanks. So I don't think it's, it, it, they'll munch on a coral, but I don't think it's enough to overwhelm a coral. Where in our glass boxes, we have so much packed into a small space that it's easier for things to kind of take over. And I think that's a big chunk of it. And again, whatever natural predators are or not in your tanks, that's going to play into it as well. So I definitely think that's a massive chunk of it. Yeah. Definitely a battle. Uh, being that the white bugs are parasitic copepods makes me wonder if the pods that live in our tank can turn into acro, turn into acro eating flesh. If the acro is healthy, I would not think so. You know, if it's dying and out the door and, you know, going downhill, maybe they'll snack at, you know, the dying tissues. I can see that for sure. But I don't think they're going to turn just from like into an acro thing. Usually a lot of these creatures already target certain things you know like you have like acro eating you know flatworms like they have a taste for that that's what they want you know on the flip side you know i know our standard issue reef copepods like some of them will actually eat detritus you know they'll start to eat some of the nasty tank and it's essentially a like miniature little cleanup crew so i think those are the good guys i wouldn't worry about them uh tanks are similar to monocultural just like orchards which is why pest problems have a similar impact yeah for sure it's uh, it's a closed system, right? So stuff is condensed into one little space. And if you're doing something to boost their population or let them expand and nothing's hunting them down, then they can make it to plague proportions.
But yeah, I think anything that's fresh from the ocean, 100% quarantine. Like if you're going like the Maricultura route, ideally set up a separate quarantine tank. Um, Adam from Fred Grads, like I kind of like what he does where when he first gets a coral, cause same thing, he knows if you get a fresh coral in and you dip it, that puts a lot of extra stress on it. So he'll put his acros in like an LPS system. You know, put an LPS in like an acro system, something where it's opposite systems where you can observe it for a bit. And then once you know that there's nothing on it, you know, you can dip it once it's had time to settle and then move into your main systems. Uh, do, do, do. Got some acro frags from PTO. Most are doing well. One turn brown. I put it in my tank. Skin is green again, but pulps are still brown. Any tips? Was it like a frag from the tank or is it from the ocean? So if it was something from the ocean, usually they come in really colorful. And then usually they'll go brown and they'll stay brown for a little while and eventually they'll start coloring up again. Um, so if it's a freshly imported, that would make sense. If, you know, it was growing out in his tank and then you got it, and then it turned brown and you know it could be just a swing in stability you know it could be your nutrients could be the lighting usually i find a lot of corals like they'll take a while to settle in and then they'll come back once they're in that stable happy environment um what methods are you following moonshiners saturated calc etc i don't know i have my own special blend methods on all right let's start in the circle so the nano, I don't think you can see it, but it's probably out of camera view. Okay. Anyways, over here, just side of you is my nano tank. This one just has the two clowns, some inverts and my gonies. And that one is just running strictly all for reef on a doser. That's it. Whenever I do a water change on this tank or the water box, I give that, that one a water change as well. So it gets slightly more than the other ones. That was easy. Uh, this tank it just has regular dosing. So down there, if you can see it, I got three big containers, elk, calcium, magnesium, and that's using the dose tonic. And that one gets dosed just based off what my levels are on the water box, which is in opposite wall behind me in the other room. That one is a special blend of everything. I have a calcium reactor that does 43 ish mils a day. I dose about 75 mils a day of a hydroxide base elk as well as calcium. And then I also do four and a half to six and a half liters a day of Kalkwasser. It's not fully saturated, but I do mix it up more than normal. So it's something kind of in the middle. And I think I also have about 25 mils of all free on that one. And then for the trace elements, this is like the special blend tank of everything. And then trace elements, I have the traffic marine and Kiana doser. Now I do know that's kind of like the daily automated thing. And I do moonshiner periodically. If I do an ISP test and my loves are to whack, I'll use that to correct it and I'll tweak it based off there. Now I was doing a daily for a while and things were looking awesome. Again, that was slacking on that for quite a while now. So now I'm kind of see where the it's going to be at just dosing kind of like the blended A and K trace elements. And then I'll do minor tweaks with the moonshine on top of that. So that's kind of the big blend. Um, yeah, to tag someone, yeah, at sign and just start typing their username. Cruz, good to see you, buddy. It's been a while. Uh, a castle needs to mate with a Stratton. Be an interesting mix. It has been a long time, Cruz. How are you doing there, buddy? Hope you're doing good. Uh, do, 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 do. All right, let's go back in the chat. Still low key, don't like the Stratons, didn't get the hype of following. Um, I'm gonna say the Stratons is just cause it's like a massive panel. It's probably awesome for light coverage. Never personally use them, but they do look sweet being like so thin and minimalistic. Um, Brian, hello, enjoy your videos. Thanks Brian, appreciate it. Uh, what's your hot coral that's overly priced right now? I haven't followed the trend in a few months. I don't even know what the trends are anymore. <laughs> I don't know. My my current obsession is Gonies at the moment. Me, Gonies, and I love Millie. Anything Shaggy Polyps is like the ones that I love. Uh, okay, my tank uses a lot of calcium and elk. They're on dosing pumps. I try to dose correction doses for one, the other drops. Okay, so if you... If you dose a lot of elk, it will push your calcium down. If you dose a lot of calcium, it'll push your elk down. So it's kind of like a teeter-totter. 
and just here fitting right so you dose lots of one it's gonna push the other one up or down now magnesium is like the pendulum for this so if your mag magnesium is low it's gonna be more extreme ups and downs um, if you raise your magnesium higher it's gonna make the pendulum kind of more even and not as extreme so you're probably low on magnesium which is the moral of the story of that one I personally like to keep in that kind of 1250 to like 14 something range um, yeah so definitely check your magnesium you're probably low bump it up a bit and you'll be good um, speciosa yeah that's probably one of those ones there a lot of people say that they're very delicate and they're really easy to die like they'll be happy one day and all of a sudden they will the skin will start receding and it's all over so that one is tricky i haven't bothered yet because for a couple hundred dollars for a frag that's likely gonna off itself is a little crazy but i think eventually once they've been you know a couple generations in the tank they'll probably be safe to get them but they are pretty cool looking um uh, if you want to throw money away by those yeah so i don't know it wouldn't be my first choice right now but it'll be a while before i try that one what elk are you what elk are you running yours at do you notice any difference in coral growth especially acros and coloration between high and low elk um either one can work i always shoot for in the middle like i generally that eight eight to nine range so usually eight and a half is just the happy medium target I have had in the past my old Red Sea Nano tank. I've had that one where actually I didn't check my elk for a long, long time and it dripped down. And it was like six and a half or something like that for who knows how long. And the acros look great. Everything was happy. So you, you can absolutely run a tank with low elk and you could absolutely do it with high elk. Now, one of the reasons some people run higher elk is because higher elk will also help give you higher pH. Um, so that is kind of one of the reasons people go that method. But so I've, you know, I've had it at a higher elk, I've had a lower elk, either could be fine, but you know, generally you just want to keep stuff stable. Usually the eight to nine range is kind of middle-ish of the spread, kind of a safer realm if you go in high, up or down a bit. Do you own a rainbow splice? I do not. Um, if so, any tips on getting the red? I do not have a splice. The only one I have is like the grafted Monty. Other than that, they're just the, the regular solo non-grafted coral. Um, I have a reverse tiger torch not doing well. Not much flesh bland or extension. All my other high-end torches doing great. Dipped it already. No pass. Do you suggest KFC? I would. Um, the biggest thing for me is if that flesh band is receding up towards the mouth, it is just like slowly fading. Um, for me, the KFC dip completely, you know, six months, a year later after doing it, I have a nice big thick flesh bland where a lot of mine were receding. So in my opinion, it worked well. Um... Albert, what's your opinion on chasing pH over elk stability? I think elk stability is important. I I don't know. I've been chasing pH, but now I'm wondering why I'm chasing it so much. Because <laughs> at the point now, my water box is like, okay, I don't want my corals to grow any faster now. I should stop chasing it. Um, but there's a certain level where higher pH is healthier for the tank. But I don't think you need to get crazy. If it's above 8, be happy, don't worry about it. If you're, you know, 7.8, 7.9, then yeah, you probably want to bump it up a bit. How many milligrams of ozone do you run in your tank roughly for how long? I use a Poseidon 200, which I believe is a 200 milligram unit, and I run it at three and a half, I believe. So I don't know if the scale is correct, but 200, so assuming it was 20 points for each one. So, but theoretically that's 70 milligrams. I don't know if that's correct though, but yeah, the Poseidon 200, I run it around three and a half and I run it from two in the morning to four in the morning or five in the morning, something like that. I can check it later for you. Uh, do, 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 do. do you think phosphates results with ATI testing are accurate? They always come back super high. I have an ATI ICP test. I will send it off and I will do a manual test and I'm, we will let you know. We'll find out. Da -da. How to get rid of clove polyps? Yep, febendazole. Um, there's one I bought a long time ago called fishbenzidol, which is the same thing. I don't know if it's still around. But yeah, febenzidol will take out clove polyps. So if you have rainbow clove polyps, remove those babies from your tank. If you're trying to get rid of the purple clove or the blue clove, that's a great solution to get rid of them. 
Um, what is the highest contributing variable for SPS coloration in your experience? If you have found a difference in coloration due to PO4 and O3, which levels are best? I don't think nitrate and phosphate is a massive thing. If you have low nitrates and phosphates, that's more, your corals will be a bit lighter and paler and they'll have a bit of a thicker skin in theory. Um, I don't think that's as healthy for the coral. I've always kept mine a bit higher, which you tend to get a little bit of a darker, richer, deeper colors. Um, so that's kind of where I went. So honestly, phosphates, historically 0.03 to 0.9 so is what I kept it. Now, you know, I've set to 0.15, I'm not too worried about it. Nitrates, anything to like two to 20, I don't really worry about it too much. Um, now for, coloration so again they need to be happy this is one of the biggest things if there is something a pest bugging the coral it's not going to be happy if there's a fish picking at it it's not going to be happy if you're having big parameter swings it's not going to be happy so keeping a lot of these things stable and make sure there's nothing picking on the coral goes a long way um and you can get really nice coral color once a coral settles and is happy now that being said there is the trace element thing which can absolutely affect it as well but you kind of need all the other stuff to be in line first before you're worrying about tweaking trace elements so if you're deficient in you know s some of the elements or if you're excessively high in it that can also affect the color of a coral now if you're doing regular water changes it's probably not a big issue if you never do water changes if you never do water changes, then it probably is an issue. So it's hard to say. I don't. I wouldn't necessarily say just one thing, but you know, having your water parameters stable and making sure nothing's picking on your coral is kind of the main first step for it being happy. And then trace if you're already at that point to help kind of like refine and bring out those extra bits of color. Um, now, the other consideration too is the lighting on your tank. So if you the light you see is what's reflected back to you. So if you only have, you know, a blue and white light on the tank, you might not be seeing all the full colors of the tank. So I don't know if you use my schedule or not, but if you do, um, you know, about four hours of my day is elevated, you know, with the reds and the green, the whites and more of a crisper full spectrum look. Now, all these extra spectrums, one, help reflect that back to you, but it also does a bit of a bit of a par boost to the corals to kind of simulate like that high noon. And I feel like it helps bring out some of the colors and helps it grow faster. Um, how can we get your schedule? I did, I've done a couple of videos on the Reef Dudes Radio on schedule now. And in those videos, if you look at the video description, there's a Dropbox links to the file. Um, the easiest way to load it on your phone is if you have a Dropbox account, you can just save it to your Dropbox and then open it from there. When you open it, you just say open in and then open it within the Mobius app and you can import it there. So that's what I've done. Tried and true. Like, you know, I've had a coral a month ago. There's a coral that spawned in my tank. So corals are spawning under my schedule. I'd say they're pretty happy. So yeah, definitely. I don't know. Check it out. I, I use it with the Radeon Pros. And it starts in the morning, you know, blue heavy. It starts and slowly fades up to around noonish. It's that nice, crispy, you know, still vibrant, but whiter look for about four hours. And then it starts to fade back to more of an AB plus look until the evening. And it fades down to more of the blues. But I've been rocking that for years, you know, and just the fact that a coral spawn underneath it now, this shows it's they're happy. They like it. So it's been good. Um... Any tips on keeping Aptasia under control? I see three or four, but I don't want a hundred. If you have three or four now, deal with them before they spread, number one. Um, I find F Aptasia works pretty well out of all the main brand products. You kind of smother, turn off your flow, smother it in it, and it makes a bit of a, like, a little crusting tomb over it. If you don't have that, turn off your flow, and you can take super glue and just smother it in super glue, make a little super glue tomb so it doesn't spread. Now to control it, I mean, copper bands are awesome. Again, some people have issues getting the cylinder of the tank, but they're awesome fish. They will eat them. Uh, Bergy and Udebrank are awesome. 
they do take a bit of time, but that's the only thing they eat. So if you only have a couple, they'll probably disappear after that. Um, peppermint shrimp, usually as long as you have a couple of them, they tend to eat them as well. But if you only have a couple, I would just manually treat it. As always, awesome answer. You're most welcome, Jay. Uh, CJK, coral health equals coral color. Exactly, right? It has to be happy in order for it to kind of shine and show its stuff. Um, do, do, do. Oh yeah, file fish, good call, Ryan. That's another good one. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it nips at some stuff a little more, but it's never much of an issue. I find file fish are hit or miss. I've had some that have been phenomenal, haven't touched thing, and I've heard of some that have just like devoured LPS. What am reefer? Devin's schedule is great, been running for about four years. Thank you. I don't know if, but at one point I remember it was potentially going to get added to the Mobius app. I don't know if it ever did. I'm going to bug him and find out about that. Fun. Yeah. Fun fact. Uh, Molly Miller Blennies can eat Aptasia. Good to know. They can work well for um, algae as well. Uh, do, do, do Calc paste also. Yeah, calc paste can work well for sure. Um, you could also eat... Not the safest, but um, so kelk, you could also use like a sodium hydroxide, which is similar to kelk. Um, don't get it in your skin, nasty stuff, but again, it will also kill it. Do you still use the AI blades? If so, what is your honest thoughts for growth and spread? Well, speaking of AI blades, we have two of them along right along here, right beside the radions. So yes, um, they're not using as my main light on here. They're using kind of fill light and a bit more pop around it. And you can't see it, but I do have the 12 inch or 14 inch, whatever the smaller blade is on the nano tank beside me. Um, so I am still using them. And yes, I think they have great spread. I think it's super cool. Do the blades come in white? I don't think so. I think they're only in black, but it would be cool if they did come in white. But yeah, no, I think they're cool lights. The fact that they're fanless, I like. And um, can I show this? Where's my phone? Yeah, so a couple cool things about the blades. Um, one, focus. So I like how it sits so low to the tank. So it, like there's no light in your eyes. There's no light spread. There's no wasted light because it's it's a low profile, which I think is a really cool feature. Um, you know, things are growing well underneath it. You know, there's no fan. It's silent. Like, I think there's a lot of really cool features and aspects to the blades. So I think they're cool. Like, if I was to run only blades, though, I, I would alternate them. So I would have a grow and then a glow. Or I'd probably do like a grow and two glows likely. It depends on the tank size, but I would alternate them so you have that kind of fuller spectrum of the two. But it really depends on the tank setup. But no fans, silent, you know. I've dropped mine in the tank by accident a couple times and it's been fine so far, so reasonably waterproof. Um, if you could only pick one, would you keep your Mastertronic or your Apex? These are hard questions. I'm trying to decide what to get first. Okay, two different, mo two different methods and models. I don't think I would use my Mastertron. Okay, you could do this, but I don't think I would use my Mastertronic to test every single day because I would be too lazy and I wouldn't change the reagent bottle and refill them quite enough. I use mine to test weekly or twice a week for, you know, some parameters. And I can go a few months before I got to refill my reagent bottles. And that's a nice, happy place. Um, if you want, I like the Mastertronic for testing everything but elk but okay i have an alcatronic i have the trident i have other stuff to test elk so i don't really use my mastertronic to test elk but you know if you want to test like potassium or your nitrates or your phosphates or you know magnesium once in a while i think that's a big benefit to it um like with the trident like i wouldn't care to trust you know magnesium every day but i mean it's kind of part of the deal you get it so for instance you know if i was to test you know if I was only using Mastertronic, I would maybe test elk once a day, and I would probably test calcium and mag once a week. And same thing, nitrogen phosphate once a week. I'd probably set it up similar to that. Um, with the Trident, you know, again, when we talked about last week's stream, I have mine kind of testing half as much as I normally do, which is, you know, recommended, but it works. I do know 
you know, my one month reagent kit, you know, two months later, three months, whatever. I do know the calcium and meg's a little bit off at that point, but it's something that I'm aware of. I'm not too worried about it. I mainly just care about the elk on it. But so I don't know. The the trident is a easier experience. You know, you put your stuff in there and you got your results every day, which is nice. It's nice to have more frequent results. I don't know. It's, it's all a trade off, to be honest. It's hard to say. I bike like them both for different reasons. A happy hump day to you too, Aqua Zen Garden. I probably use mine for iodine and potassium. Yeah, so I appreciate, you know, with the Master Chronic, the Reef Bot, how you could test so many different things, which is really cool. Uh, Ryan, I'm going to wait and see as I can for an auto tester a year or two. I believe more will come up, be more competitive, but trying to control dosing is an appealing option. Yeah, no, it, it definitely is. I have been using that on my other tank to tweak my dosing on top of it. So I have the calcium actor and the calc doing kind of the base and I have dosing on top of that, which I let the trident tweak if it's too high or too low, which is, it works pretty well. It's a really cool way to do it. Uh, do Taylor rate Oregon tort on difficulty. I have found torts very hardy in my experience. I have some actually in both my tanks and yeah, they've been pretty dang easy. So personally, I feel torts are pretty easy cores. And hey, one of my torts spawned, so that's sweet. But I've had some from like, you know, a teeny little frag, you know, years and years ago, my early days of reefing, to now spawning my tank and big and I have tons of it. So I would say they're, they're, they've survived many tanks of mine. So I would say they're easy. Any experience with kafta bred mandarins? Mandarin fish are awesome. As long as you have a good pod population, they're pretty much self-sufficient. You know, mine will eat mysis, but it also probably survives on just hunting pods all day as well. You have to force be with your parameters. Yeah, no one needs an auto tester, but they're nice to have. If you don't have one, if you're not using an auto tester, manually test your tank once a week. Just get in the habit, stick with it, and long term you'll be pretty good. The, the funny thing about auto testers is you kind of get like complacent and lazy about it. So I rarely ever manually test my tank. No, even though I should once in a while, just to make sure nothing's, you know, out of whack. But you, you start to rely on them on after a while. And it's like, you know, one's out of region. I'm like, yeah, I got the other auto tester. And like, it kind of makes you lazy. But if you don't have one, once a week testing, make sure everything's in line. Brian, thank you for the 699 Super Chat. Much appreciated. Um... Much, much appreciated. Uh, Reefkeeper one from Sustainable Aquatics had about six years, ate one pellet from day one. Yeah. If you have one eating pellets, I mean, that's even better. That's a great way to go. I've never seen mine eat pellets, but it does eat mysis. And I do feed that, you know, most days. Da -da -da. Testing water is the worst. Just finish a water change and have it set up so pretty easy. Don't mind them. Um, Brian, thank you. Super chat. So... Yeah, water testing. If you think about it, you know, there's that saying we're we're not really keeping coral, we're keeping water. And that is fairly true, right? Because good water keeps the coral happy. You know, bad water is going to let them go downhill. So at the end of the day, we're keeping, you know, pristine or not even pristine, you know, within ranges of water parameters and all of our elements. Usually, okay, actually speaking of water, um, salinity. Most people do not test their salinity. If your salinity is out of whack, everything else is probably out of whack because that salt level in the water, you know, if you think about your, your alkalinity solution, your calcium solutions, you know, they're all types of salt. So if your salinity is out of whack, everything's out of whack, you know, so get, you know, your good old refractometer, since they're in reach or, you know, the digital one, this one I find, you know, I do calibrate a little more frequently. So sometimes I will just double check with the good old school refractometer, but Check it periodically, make sure it's not out of whack. I know if you're only dosing, I know that can affect it over time. Calcium reactor is kind of nice because it doesn't really affect your parameters too much. But again, you're dosing tons of calc. You know, that's with RDI water and that can affect your parameters as well. So periodically, check your salinity. Because if that's off, everything else is off and it gets up in really bad of whack. You know, I've, there's been times where our, I didn't test mine for ages and I went and looked and it was like crazy high or crazy low. Like I've had extremes from myself not testing it. So this is like giving myself hack, but also advising you guys. Just make sure you do it periodically. 
Da, da, da. Anything but the bobber is doo doo doo. Yeah, my bobber broke. Yeah, don't don't use the swing arm hydrometer. Those, those suck. But the bobber ones are good. Uh, do do do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Port Wolf. Wild fish hasn't appeared in four days. That's no good. I know certain fish. I've had um like certain wrasses have added to a tank. There's been ones I didn't see for a month. And also like a month later they're out, they're swimming around. Like if it's a new fish, sometimes they're timid and they will hide. Now file fish, they're kinda bigger. They don't really go in the sand bed. So that one's a little more questionable, but Jay, any experience using Kelquaster on a dosing pump with three part dosing? Want to increase my pH but maintain a super stable parameters, what's the best way to introduce Kelk? Um, you absolutely could put on a dosing pump. I've always went the um, Kelk Wasser reactor method, mainly because you don't have to store as much because you need to dose a fair amount of Kelk. So personally, I would dose as much Kelk as I evaporate. So essentially using your Kelk reactor as your ATO more or less. And then that kind of takes the base of your dosing and then you can dose all your other parameters on top of it to kind of tweak it. And then you'll use a little bit less of the three part because the calc is doing kind of like your core base of it. That's kind of the method I've always taken with it. And again, the main reason for the calc wash reactor is just because you can top it off, you know, every like week, 10 days, two weeks, depending on how much you're dosing. And it's a lot easier to do. Or if you just mix up your stock solution, which you can do, but I find you go, you burn through it a lot quicker, um, especially with how much you have to dose. Like, you know, for instance, on my water box, like it's because I'm dosing my evaporation, you know, I'm dosing, you know, four to six liters a day, which would empty your dosing container pretty darn quick. So that's kind of the main reason I'm a big fan of the, the calc reactor method. Uh, Brian, I swapped from Hannah Slimity pen back to the trust refractor meter. Pen was always off. I didn't want to recalibrate every week. Yeah, I find I recalibrate mine about once a month-ish. But yeah, I mean, refractor meters are pretty tried and true. You know, drop of RODI water and you'll make sure it's correct. You know, or if you want to be extra good, you can get the proper cal calibration solution. Do, do, do. Is there a way to keep the smell of a reef mat down? Any ideas? I don't really notice any smell from my Clarice, oddly. I was worried about that before I had one, but I think when it's dry and it wraps it up, I don't really get much of a smell. Now, I do use ozone on the tank, and maybe that affects it, maybe that pre breaks stuff down. I don't know if that is, but I haven't really had a big smell from it. So, any guys in the chat are using, you know, reef mats or roller mats? You get any funky smell from it? I'm curious. But yeah, just as a general thing, um, I know I do talk about ozone a fair amount, and one of the main reasons is just because it does work so well for getting rid of any odors and scents, and definitely works for that. Ah, uh, Ryan, just order the hydrometer now. No one to break it. Yeah, so the barber ones. That little stem on the top, be careful. It is delicate. You know, mine lasted a year or two until it finally broke. But the nice thing is, it's always calibrated. Um, the issue with it is it's so tall, you need, you know, something deep to put it in to check it. Um, you can use the case on some instances on it. You know, if you're going to put it in your tank, just turn off the flow so it's not going all over the place. But the nice thing is it's always kind of calibrated. Um, John, do you ever use poly filter and what are your thoughts? Um, it's been a while, but I used to. That used to be something I would periodically put in my nanos. So usually in the overflow tower of a nano, every once in a while I put in there just to polish the water. Or um, if you set up a brand new tank and you add a bunch of sand, you always get all those particulates that kind of go through your system. That's another really good time to use it. And the other thing I found that worked well, if you go to a fabric store, they'll have the like fleece stuff i think it's made for blankets but it's very thin fleece and it's similar to polyfill but you can just cut out like a little square and pop in your overflow tower for smaller tanks and <clears throat> that was a very cheap easy way to do it mm -mm 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 -mm. i know slots are subjective but what do you use i've used tons you know honestly you can use whatever salt you want your tank is probably going to be happy for doing water changes. Just using salt to do water changes is going to keep your tank happier. Um, that's the biggest step. 
Now, where fancier salts are likely going to have better trace element levels in it. <coughs> ah, Throat's a little dry. And they're likely going to be a lot cleaner. So if I'm just using, doing a water change, I don't really, in like a brute container, I'll use whatever salt I have. Like half time I'll buy whatever's on sale. If I'm doing auto water changes and I want my bins to stay clean, then I'll be lean towards using like a cleaner salt, you know, like the Tropic Marin's an awesome salt that's super clean. I know the Aqua Forest salt works pretty well for that too. They're the Fauna Marine salt super clean. If I'm doing big bins and I don't want them to get nasty and have to clean them every six months, then a nice clean salt is, you know, more ideal. If I'm just doing a big water change, I'm not going to worry about it as much. I'll buy whatever's on sale. So that's the biggest thing in salts, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the other consideration is what are the levels of the salt and what are the levels of your tank? If you keep your tank at an elk of nine, ideally find a salt that has an elk of nine. You know, if you keep your elk at seven, you'll know, find a salt that has an elk closer to seven. That way, if you have to, you have an issue or you do a big water change in your tank, you're not going to cause a big parameter swing. So that's like the other big consideration, right? If you're doing some panic thing, you don't want to throw off all your levels and annoy the rest of your tank. So finding something already in that range is going to keep everything happier. So a few different considerations. Um, I did a live stream with Ryan a little while back. We did the ultimate salt comparison. And Ryan was amazing because he actually tested an ICP a bazillion different salts. And I do, just to give you that ultimate salt test, here you go. Uh, let me share this link. So boom, that link is on to the Google Drive and it is basically Ryan's ICP results in comparison of a whole slew of different salts. So one, what can you find locally that's new, easy to get? And then, you know, what is similar ranges where you keep your tank at? Those are the two main things I would consider for picking a salt. But aside from that, if you're not too worried about it, buy whatever's on sale. You know, if you're doing auto water changes or doing small water changes, you're not going to have a big parameter swing and it matters less. Uh, people also ask all the time, they're like, how do I change salts? You just start doing water changes with new salt. Nothing special. I've, you know, mixed half and half of one salt. I've just, you know, just start using a new one. And if you're doing like an 80% water change and the parameters are way different, yes, that can cause an issue. But if you're doing, you know, a 10% water change, you're not going to have much of a swing and it's not a big concern. Here's the salt spiel. Hopefully that answered all your questions. Uh, do, 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 do. I know you recommended manila clams to get new copper bands eating. Yes, yes, I have. And that has definitely worked well. I have, you know, a copper band in both of my large systems, love them. And that has worked very, very well for me. Where's he hiding? I don't know if you can see him in the back, but I have one nice, beautiful copper band right around there. Kind of blurred into the blue background, but yeah, super, super cool. And that's worked very well. Uh, do, do, do. Yeah, I mean, it's very rare that salts have an issue, like very rare. Like I know, you know, I've, I've seen once or twice where there's actually been an issue with something with the salt, but it, it takes something very extreme for salt to crash a tank, or cause an issue. I think a lot of people blame it on that because they just did a water change. But I also think a lot of the time something else was going on and, you know, people just like to, you know, assume it's the last thing they did. So I, again, it's hard to say for sure, but this is a general load. Um, Haley, I got to pick up a load of rock tomorrow from a shutdown. Hopefully change it soon. Nice. Oh, that's the thing. If I do it. Okay. Here's a question. If I do do a new tank in here, do I reuse my rock or do I get something all new and do a whole new scape and be time a new reefer and just start from scratch again? I don't know. These things, all these random things I'm debating. And if I do new rock, you know, if I do like a craze, I don't know. I still got to decide what to do. Uh, what do you think about the new Reef Breeder Mandarins? I don't know about the... Or Meridians, is that a light? Reef Breeders makes lights. Let me Google this. I feel like it's their lights. Reef Breeders Pico Photon. I don't know if we're talking about the fish or if we're talking about lights. Let me get back to on that one. Uh, fill a couple of buckets of low elk 
One where the very high mag, like you said, not enough to crash a tank, but some might be concerned about. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know. That's one of the biggest things is you're likely not going to crash your tank. Uh, floor to ceiling tank? No, I wish. I'm on a second floor. That would probably be a dangerous, dangerous venture on this one. Uh, I need to do a video of my Cade. Lots of people like the Cade tanks. They're not, I've never had or tried a Cade tank. <coughs> but it does make me a bit curious how they are. Lots of people seem to really like them. So if you do have one, I'm kind of curious what you think. Yeah. Um, Ugly Reefer. Quick tips for starting an SPS only peninsula and tank recommendations. Um... Tank measurements is really depends on your space. I, if I do one, all right, so, so we'll talk about this one now. Go back. The size of your tank depends on your space. Now, two considerations. If you're doing SPS heavy, acros, I love top down with acros. So personally, I'm debating doing a shallower tank. So I get a lot of that top down goodness. Now, if you want a sand bed, taller tank is probably better because then it gives you more ability to crank the flow without creating the sand dunes. If you're doing bare bottom, you can get away with shallow. Those are kind of the considerations. Now, as for, you know, how big of a tank, it really depends what fits your space. You know, you can do something crazy like I did and, you know, your tank takes up your whole friggin' wall, which is questionably too big in my little dinky office. But there you go. Um, like my Ponsa tank, I basically removed the banner of the stairs and I went to the, you know, the banner was six-ish feet, so that's where my tank is six-ish feet. Just, it's like whatever fits your space. Um, the other consideration, if you do a tiny tank, you're probably going to be addicted to coral and want a bigger tank and you might upgrade. So pick what you want on that one. It really depends on your space. How often do you ICP? Not enough. Um, do you top individual elements based on your results? Yes, I do. If I do an ISP test and certain ones really low, then I will definitely dose them and bump them back up to, you know, more ideal levels. How are the dirt frogs? They're awesome, actually. They're watching me right now. I should get a dirt frog hammer, I think. That shows up. That's on the other side of my desk. That's my little dirt frog vivarium. And yeah, the, the dirt frogs are super cool. It always cracks me up because a lot of time they're just like watching me do stuff. Okay, he's just sitting there watching me. He's like, what you doing out there? Where are the fruit flies at? Yeah, so they're super cool. Um, dart frogs are awesome. Um, da -da -da. AJ, I have a six foot shallow lagoon. Need to clean the bottom underneath of the tank. Prep for a new stand, lighting, leveling pad. Any tips to get under the tank? I think it'll be fine to stand outside. You can stand, you should be able to stand a tank on its side. I know I have this four foot by two foot sump and I had that one on end, you know, get it out of the room, no problem. I mean, if your tank breaks, I'm not responsible. Um, but personally, I've done that, you know, same thing with this big shallow tank. It was end on end getting into this room and it was fine. Um, do, 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 do. um, have they started calling yet? Doing legs. These guys are actually very quiet. These are erratus, and I purposely got them because they're quiet because I didn't want loud frogs to be able to pick up on the microphone if I'm working or whatnot. Um, yes, they have laid eggs, and I've actually raised them and had babies, and I have a second little vivarium downstairs that has, you know, five or six babies that I've raised from eggs. So it's kind of cool. So that was just kind of a fun experiment project. Uh, what do you think of the innov innovative marine tanks, specifically the 200 EXT Peninsula? Let me look that one up. Um, I had innovative marine tanks in the past, and it was all good until a curved glass one cracked on me, so that sucked. That being said, all of their regular style tanks have been very good to me in the past. Um, let's see if I can find that one. But in general, all the regular tanks are pretty sweet. The 200 XT looks cool. I don't know why I'm not finding their website right now. Innovative Marine. 
Uh, Reefkeeper, due to clean my Ozo tech for the first time, just flush the Corona discharge with RDI and hit with the air compressor? Yep, pretty much. You are unlocked because I have one sitting there. We can demonstrate. So, essentially, on there, we have our two input and outputs. And if you look at it, it's basically just a tube that connects the, the Corona discharge tube. Take a big syringe full of RODI water. I'll do a little video on this at some point and just force a bunch of RODI water through it. Um, you're basically just rinsing out any of the nitric acid inside of it. Um, take that, then once you're done, just take an air compressor, blow some air through it and dry it all out. Put it back in, it's super easy to do. You know, it takes a couple minutes, do that every six months or so and you'll be good. So super duper easy. Feel free to shoot me a message if you've got any questions on it. Um, do, 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 do. You are most welcome. Yeah, ask away if you have any questions, but super easy to do. Just, you know, flush it out with RODI, make sure you dry it out really well, and then put it back in business. Um, and yeah, honestly, if you're not using an air dryer, something I'd probably do every six months or so just to keep things happy. If you have an air dryer, you probably never have to worry about it. And yeah, I don't know. I think if there's any last minute questions, ask away. Otherwise, I think I gotta go get my little guy pretty quick here. Fish tank only shutting down. No time for it. Oh no. That sucks, Haley. Um, Alright guys, yeah. So any other questions after the stream, throw them in the comments below and you know, next random q and I'll circle back and hit them up. But otherwise, guys, hopefully everyone enjoyed today's random live stream. Um, shout out to Shelly and Brian. Thank you guys for the super chats. Those are definitely appreciated. And yeah, if you guys enjoyed it, as always, hit the like button. If you're new, subscribe. I'll catch you guys in the next live stream. Have a good night, guys.